Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, panel. The, the title mm -hmm. that has been given is uh, Rethink Security, a Tale of Two Shores, a New Security Architecture in the Gulf. I introduce myself. My name is Maria Gianniti. I am a foreign correspondent at TG Uno Rai, that is uh, the Italian broadcasting service, public broadcasting service. And I will co-moderate this panel with uh, Julian barnes Desi, that is the director of the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Why we discuss about the Gulf, about the security of this region? Because there have been a lot of things going on there. There is a rise of insecurity in the region, uh, start for, due to several factors. The first of all, starting with the US withdrawal from the GCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on the nuclear program and uh, then this led to threats of uh, um, freedom of navigation in uh, this area and also the rising tension in Iraq for example to after the US-led assassination of the Iranian general Soleimani and just a few days ago as everybody knows also the killing of uh, Fakhrizadeh that is the man behind the um, Iranian nuclear program. So there is a lot to discuss with our guest panelist and and our first uh, panelist um, is the Foreign Affairs Minister of Oman, Al Busaidi, Alan Wasallam. Uh, how much are you worried for what is going on right now? I think we have a problem with the audio. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, please. Hi, greetings Hi. from Oman. Thank you for the opportunity to meet my colleagues and you uh, through this medium. And I hope we will soon be able to travel and visit Rome, beautiful Rome, which we miss very much. Um, in response to your question, really, um, I tend to hold the view a view that is one of optimism. We should always have that hope that as we evolve and as we develop, uh, we can see hope for a very effective and sustainable security structure for this region. But this security structure to be able to make it sustainable will undoubtedly have to be inclusive and it will have to be based on a multilateral set of work between all the regional states, because that is, will ensure the necessary confidence that should be built as pillars of security for all of us. Uh, we have been blessed for so many years in the GCC to have actually enjoyed um, a very healthy working relationship. Uh, but the world is changing and there are transitional developments taking place almost everywhere. And now with the pandemic, which added a new set of certain uh, challenges that needs to be dealt with, but all these challenges cannot be dealt single-handedly. It has to be dealt on the concept of, of cooperation uh, and inclusivity. Thank you, Minister. So I will leave the floor to my co-moderator, to Julian, please, for the next, quest next question. Thank you, you very much, much and very, very good, good to be with, all you, with you all this afternoon. Um, I wondered if we could turn to Yemen. Uh, Mr. El Hadrami, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, Yemen is often seen as one of the key regional hotspots for a lot of the regional tensions. Obviously, we talk a lot about the nuclear deal, but then we talk about the regional situation. Um, there is some hope in some quarters that Yemen might be the space uh, for some cooperation between regional states. What possibilities do you see in terms of that happening? Are regional and domestic players within Yemen really moving towards an agreement, towards a, a desire for peace? Or do you see a continued stalemate uh, which is going to afflict the country even as the humanitarian and economic situation continues to deteriorate? 
Well, well, thank you very much uh, for having us, uh, of course, here. And, and, and let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Italian Foreign Ministry and, and ISPI for, for organizing this. We wish to, to be in, in Rome today, but, but uh, I think we, uh, as we all grappling with this pandemic, we're happy to, to see everyone. You know, it's, it's a vital question, and I think Yemen uh, situation and the current situation in Yemen is, is vital to the security of the region. And as you said, it's a local... Uh, motivated, rooted conflict that didn't start because of the, the, the rivalry in the region, but it was in fact exacerbated because of the rivalry in the region. How Yemen would play within this uh, theater of the region is also important. And I think one of the main questions that I wanted to highlight, and perhaps answering that question, would, would lead to what would the situation be in Yemen like in the future and how it would actually relate to the security of, of the region. And in answering that question, I think it would, it would shed some light to the, to, the, to the question you said. I mean, one of the, the issues that we have in Yemen that the war has taken so long now. We're in the sixth year of, of, of the war. And, and I think if, if the war did not see an end soon, it, it would not be good news, not just for Yemen alone, but, but also for the region. And, and that is, uh, of course, in turn, because of the geostrategic location that, that Yemen holds near the Bab al-Mandab Strait, near the, the, the very extremely important region, uh, which, which holds a very significant uh, status in, 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 in the market. So, so having the question, and when would the conflict in Yemen which has been exacerbated because of the rivalry in the region end would actually shed light in, in, in some of the, the, and answer the questions that, that you answered. And, 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 and I think if, if we are to answer or try to attempt to answer that question, we need to uh, focus on, on, on answering a more specific question, which is how to end this conflict. And, and, and I believe uh, three issues need to be highlighted in that sense. And dealing with any of these issues uh, separately from other issues would would eventually not 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 reach to the to, to the conclusion. I mean, one of the issues that we need to to solve in Yemen is is basically uh, the need that not to view the Yemeni conflict as a humanitarian crisis alone. I mean, solely meaning or or viewing by some of the international uh, donors that that Yemen is 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 merely a humanitarian crisis really sends the wrong signals for the rebels and for the Houthis that that they will be recognized in the future and that the political solution is not near. I think the second point is is Iran has to stop supporting the Houthis and has to stop interfering in our region and has to respect international law. Iran needs to know that if it needs to stay as a good neighbor, it needs to spend its own money raising its own uh, uh, and, and, uh, issues with home, but not, not sending it to some malicious and, and killing Yemenis and, and others in, in the region. And I think the third point that, that, that needs to be highlighted is that we do have some internal disputes and internal frictions within the coalition. I mean, if, if you see at, at, at what is happening now, we have one of the strongest coalition, unanimous support by the international community, uh, the best weapons that money could buy, uh, a repressed regime in the north uh, with the Houthis, with no democracy, uh, wanting to resurrect this Hashemite legacies, uh, which is uh, adopting the, the theocracy model of Iran. And, and yet six years and we're not finishing it. And, 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 and we need to highlight that the Riyadh agreement needs to be implemented which is one of the main things that would stick and make this coalition stick together. But 13 months now, and, and we don't see any, any end to that. And I, I think, and with, with all honesty, with, without the cooperation and, and the re-collaboration uh, or the, the, the re-thinking uh, uh, of, of the United Arab Emirates strategy and agenda in Yemen by not fully supporting those elements in the STC to do what they do in Yemen, we would not see an end of this. I mean, I just wanted to just, just say this, lay it out, because without really understanding fully what is to come and what's at stake in Yemen, I, I don't think we could relate to uh, any other issues. Um, I, I elaborated some more, but I could elaborate more if you want. Thank you. Let, let me just ask one follow-up then. I mean, in that context, how willing and ready is the, the government that you represent uh, to negotiate with the Houthis and to try and take this process forward? And linked to that, 
How is a Biden administration going to change calculations on the ground and in the region? We know that the U.S. wants to end this war. Um, do you think that could help deliver a necessary push on all the players? Yes, of course. I mean, we have. I mean, we wanted this war to end yesterday, not today. We we tried to to uh, to actually start the process after the U U United Nations Security Council uh, Secretary General Mr. Guterres back in March called for this. Uh, attempt to cease fire and focus on COVID. We followed up with it. We welcomed it. We welcomed the crisis meeting that Martin Griffiths called for in March. So, so I, I, we we are trying to do whatever we can to end this. And remember, the conflict in Yemen happened because the Houthis' actions. Everything in there, including us and the coalition, is a reaction to that action. When you say, uh, when, you, when you brought in the, the perspective of the Biden administration, the future U.S. administration, we do maintain and have long maintained a strategic partnership with the United States in terms of many fields, including counterterrorism and violent extremism. And that will continue no matter what the change is in, in the new administration. You know, Yemen is... is is, is in this region is, is so important for countering terrorism, is so important for the strategic uh, interests of not just the United States, but the West. So what I would probably say, and, and I think I hope the Biden administration in the future will, will take into, into consideration, is how to deal with the Iranian deal, the JCPOA. We believe, uh, as others in the region, in an inherent flaw in that deal, which was it tries back, starting from 2013, 2015 and on, to solve the Iranian issue uh, without dealing with the greater issues in the Middle East, which the tentacles of Iran been wreaking havoc ever since. And, and that would not work. We know that we need a free Middle East from uh, uh, nuclear weapon. That's, that's been the case. But without really dealing with what would Iran do, how it would benefit from this deal back in 2015 going on, and how it use this fund to actually raise more uh, militias uh, in Yemen, Hezbollah, and elsewhere, if we try to separate and solve these issues um, not together. I don't think we would we would we, we would win. Now, that's what happened back then. We support the current administration uh, stance in, in in the maximum pressure campaign that has been going. It's one of the things that would actually help Yemen go to peace. Not the only one, but it is one of those uh, ma major things that if we could curb Iran from from involving in Yemen, it, it would actually help the process. Okay, I, I will go to our next uh, guest panelist, that is the Al Ashraf, the Secretary General of GCC. Uh, this is an organization quite crucial right now, considering what is going on in the region, in the Gulf. How much is difficult to keep GCC together? Please. Well, thank you, thank you, Maria, and uh, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to speak and to participate in this forum uh, from Kuwait. And uh, the GCC uh, will be entering its fifth decade uh, next year. It has been uh, 40 years since the GCC was established back in 1981 by six, uh, six uh, member founding states. <clears throat> However, it has been a very challenging uh, 40 years. Um, everyone who been following the situation, uh, not only in the Gulf, but in the wider Middle East, uh, it's easy to see where the curve goes up and down. And it has been in the heart of, of the world security. And the GC had played a significant role uh, to stabilize the region. Um, in fact, it has been the stabilizer for the region, despite all the challenges and despite all the interest that we've seen uh, growing in the region. Um, at the GCC, uh, we strongly uh, believe in peace and uh, prosperity for everyone. We strongly believe on respecting the international law as well as the UN Charter. We call for everyone to stop intervening in domestic affairs of other states, respecting 
sovereignty and respecting uh, their nationalism. And this are, or these are the principles in which the GC has been calling for, for the last 40 years. And it is actually um, uh, part of the GCC uh, vision uh, to live in harmony and in peace. At the same time, uh, the GC have shown a great demonstrations of a wide range development plan uh, over the last 40 years. GCC countries has shown a significant uh, uh, development plan that focus on human capital as well as enhancing uh, huge investments on the infrastructure as well as the development aspects. Uh, last month, we've seen Saudi Arabia uh, as the presence of the G20. Uh, suppositions well deserved uh, simply because it is reflecting what we believe on, what we stand for. Uh, looking forward and in light of the pandemic, I think the challenge is even greater. The challenge is sparing no one. And I think it is a time to demonstrate uh, a joint action uh, where the COVID-19 have shown that no one can work through this pandemic alone. But if we work together, we will be better off for the future. Um, we have been an advocate for peace. We call for everyone to respect the international law. And we believe that the people of this part of the world deserve a better future uh, by um, and making sure that the common agenda is focusing on development and prosperity for all. This is where the GC stands, and this is where we call for all the partners within the Middle East, within the region, and the world to join together to address the future challenges and to see where we can go from here. Um, I, I, will ask, uh, I will ask you a question around that because, of course, you said it, you name it, it, your intention is to try to have more, more and more cooperation on several issues. But considering what happened during recent months, not only politically, but also due to the COVID pandemic, uh, in, in con how much you could put all the countries of all the GCC country together in order to have real results of a cooperation point of view? Well, this is very obvious. I mean, f since since February, since I, <clears throat> I, I I became Secretary General, and it's this time where the COVID-19 has become an pandemic and the lockdown, there has been an endless effort jointly by all the six state members to address the issues coming from COVID-19, starting from being a health pandemic, uh, moving forward to see the consequences on different aspects of life, economic, as well as human, as well as education, labor, and so on. So the cooperation between the six states is, uh, is uh, as strong as it could be. And uh, we have maintained um, all our meetings uh, virtually. Uh, well, in fact, uh, over the last nine months or so, we managed to hold about 800 meetings virtually uh, on all different levels, uh, whether it's ministerial levels or whether it's the technical teams or support teams. Uh, this just show you how, how much we are working together and, and we are determined um, to meet our common agenda because COVID-19, as I said, have shown us that we have to work together and no one can handle these issues uh, and isolations, but together we'll be better off, as I said, and we will be better equipped, not only for this uh, crisis where all uh, nations across the world are facing, but I think it is a tough lesson that we all learned and we should be better prepared for future as well. Thank you very yeah. much. I leave the floor to Julian. Let, let me turn now to Minister Ahmed Nasser Mohammed Al-Sabah from Kuwait once again 
Um, Minister, you sit um, in, in a smaller country in the region, in a region that is beset by, by multiple challenges. Uh, again, I wonder if you could give us your sense on um, how worried you are about what comes next. Are you, is there a sense of optimism that, that some of the problems can be resolved? Um, I'd be interested to, to, to get your sense on what a Biden administration could mean uh, for new diplomatic engagement in the region and, and the prospect of, of bringing together different parties. And as part of that, I'd be very interested on, on the particular Kuwaiti perspective, given that you have played a role mediating in terms of both the intra-Gulf divisions, but also in the Arab Gulf and Iranian divisions. Is that a role that you see for yourselves going forward, particularly with your new leadership? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me, and I truly do share with uh, my other uh, fellow dignitaries our willingness uh, to be present in uh, beautiful Rome, hopefully the, in the uh, near future. I would like first to extend, since uh, you are in Italy, I would like first to extend our deepest condolences to all those who fell under COVID-19 and to wish a speedy recovery to all those who are under treatment. Uh, and in regards to your question, and especially if I see the title, the aspect of security between the two riverine uh, countries are multifaceted. And I cannot concur enough uh, with all of the uh, officials, the, minister, the, the, the ministers, but also the SG of GCC in, uh, in trying to find a uh, common denominator for all of our challenges. Uh, if I may, and before we tackle uh, the new U.S. administration, uh, in Kuwait, we see that the challenges that we, that we face during all of the, at least the 40 years of GCC are uh, uh, tripartite, uh, three-layered. First, we have uh, internally, we have lots of, of, of challenges and security challenges that we should uh, address them uh, head on. And we cannot address them head on if we are not in sync with each other. All of us are facing uh, multiple uh, challenges in our economy, in, in our economy reforms. Um, most of us, or all of us in our education and trying to rise the education uh, to, for, to 21st century, uh, all of us are facing uh, uh, um, in job seeking uh, and fulfilling our employment uh, void. Uh, um, so there are numerous challenges uh, that uh, together we can uh, face them with a more uh, um, uh, and a more uh, an approach which is more reliable to put it to put it this way, and then if we go on externally um, with Iran, we always had this problem with Iran. Uh, the problem uh, with Iran being a huge uh, neighbor, uh, Kuwait always seeked dialogue uh, with Iran, and you have mentioned that. Uh, the late His Highness, the Emir, was charged by all of GCC leaders uh, to conduct a dialogue uh, with Iran. Uh, we always call for a respect of international law, not interference in internal affairs of, uh, of countries, and reinforcing the pillars of statehood in each and every uh, country in the region. It is, uh, it is one of the things that we always say, and um, to have them all in an open dialogue where all of our concerns are on the, uh, the table. And this is our, our uh, approach, uh, for example, uh, uh, for Iran. Um, Yemen, the same thing with Yemen. Um, my uh, homologue and my brother, uh, Minister Mohammed Hadrami, mentioned um, thoroughly the, 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 the crisis in Yemen. And back in 2016, we have held talks in Kuwait 109 days. But the main issue is the respect of international law. There is international resolutions that is not respected and is not implemented uh, by the international community that we, that we truly do see that for uh, a global 
vision of security in the region, we need to maintain international law and, and to fulfill and to comply with all of the uh, international legislations uh, in this uh, regard. Um, likewise, uh, if, I, if I talk about the, the south of the Arabic Peninsula, same thing with the north of the Arabic Peninsula, with Iraq in, in this matter. And I don't know if uh, we're going to have the occasion with our uh, brethren, uh, the foreign minister of Iraq, for, for us an Iraq and stable Iraq, a more independent Iraq in its decision-making process is, is something that, uh, that, that all of us uh, in Kuwait, in GCC, and beyond in Arab League wish for Iraq in this matter to, gain, to, to be free of all of external influences uh, in Iraq. We support Iraq in, in all of, of its endeavors to be more incorporated with, within the international community, uh, within uh, its natural habitat uh, in the Arabic Peninsula and in GCC. And we encourage also a further engagement of uh, Iraq with, uh, uh, with, with the all uh, Western external uh, world. Uh, regarding the uh, future administration, uh, uh, we have worked uh, with uh, either side of the aisles all over the decades. For us, uh, maintaining the security of this region is primordial. For having a fluidity in maintaining the security of energy in, uh, in the world. Uh, this, uh, this region was always a safe haven for the past four decades, where all of, uh, of the region were in turmoil. We were the one who were navigating in a very treacherous water, but we were navigating it prudently, uh, not only for Kuwait, but also and trying to take powers for, for, for our uh, vessels. Um, we think that that is uh, the emphasis on the on the on the importance of the region will not shift from from one uh, side of the aisle, as I mentioned, to another side of the aisle. As we are dealing, uh, at least here in Kuwait, we deal with institutions, and we think that in the end, institutions uh, would uh, prevail. If I, if I could ask a quick follow-up to that, um, President-elect Biden today in an article with the New York Times seemed to reaffirm his position that he would work towards a recompliance of the nuclear deal with Iran before moving on to, re to regional issues, although he said he wanted to do that swiftly after the nuclear deal. Is that a timeline that uh, you and your regional counterparts can live with and can work with? We had mentioned back in 2015, we have welcomed JCPOA. Any tension between Iran and the international community doesn't uh, put us in a comfortable zone. But in the same time, uh, discussing security measures in the Gulf, while uh, th their partners, the GCC brethren, uh, all of us are absent, we don't think that it is the, pro the prudent move uh, to do. And so that's why we urge uh, the future administration uh, for us to be on the table, and especially if, uh, when the discussion is about uh, the security measures in the, in the Gulf and in the region. Okay, I go to the, our next guest uh, panelist, that is the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, from Iraq. Uh, thank you for joining us, first of all. Uh, well. Your colleague from Kuwait just helped me to post you the question because he's asking, try to keep Iraq not influenced by other uh, foreign, um, foreign intervention. But first of all, I would like to remind that Iraq, because the pandemic is a big issue also when we talk about security in the Gulf, that unfortunately Iraq, after Iran, is the second hit country by uh, the pandemic. So my question is also how are you dealing uh, with this? But then I would like you to follow up with what we heard by your colleague from Kuwait. Uh, your, the suggestion, please not have external interference in your internal politics. Please, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me in this forum and allowing me to participate with my colleagues and many other friends um, to discuss matters related to our countries, but also to the area. 
I think if you allow me to just to mention the challenges uh, that we are facing on one of them, and perhaps the most uh, important one has to do with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, indeed, Iraq has been hit uh, by COVID-19, and uh, it is a huge, big challenge. It affected our uh, life. Uh, it has affected also our economy, and uh, and in fact, combination of having COVID-19 and uh, uh, low price of oil uh, had uh, affected greatly our our daily life. So we are facing this challenge, as many other societies are of facing this. But uh, here because of lack of infrastructure, especially health in infrastructure, and because of security situation still we are facing uh, some threats of uh, ISIS terrorist organizations, but uh, also because of um, economic crisis or financial crisis. So it is more difficult for us to face uh, this uh, big challenge, however, we took measures and we are trying to educate our people and to educate ourselves how to prevent ourselves from this uh, disease. Um, according to our um, uh, Ministry of Health, um, the uh, COVID-19 has affected about 50, five, five, 500,000 people and around 10,000 people has passed away because of COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, so still, uh, it is a huge uh, challenge for us. Having said that, uh, we may mention also other, other challenges that we are facing. As I said, uh, the low oil price and the Iraq is depending heavily on oil income, in fact, about 88% 88, 88 of uh, the income or for the budget uh, annually is depending on, on oil income. So imagine when oil prices is going down, which kind of financial crisis that we, we will have in this, this country. Combination of COVID and the oil price and later on, of course, the decision which has been taken by all countries plus uh, to uh, decrease the the export of oil, uh, all these uh, created a uh, huge problem for us. And the other challenge, which has been mentioned directly or indirectly, but for us it is a big challenge, has to do with the tension between Washington and Tehran. For many other countries, perhaps, uh, this will be part of foreign policy or has to do with two uh, countries which are far away from them. But for us, it is an internal politics, in fact. Uh, the Iranian influence in our society and in our politics is, is uh, clear. But also the American. The American were here since 2003. Uh, and they had their army here for, with 160,000 soldiers in here. They withdraw in, in 2011, but because of uh, the attack of ISIS terrorists, we invited the American and many other allies to come back and to fight with us, the terrorist organizations of ISIS. And we are thankful for uh, their participation in, in, in the fight against ISIS. Um, so the American has got their influence in our society as the Iranian. And when they have got tension or when they have tension, then we see the results uh, in our politics. Uh, we see the results internally. And uh, so this affected our society. So you know, we have seen it that after withdrawal of the American side from uh, JCPO agreement, directly here we got conflict between two countries. And uh, affected us also on security wise. Uh, we hope that the new administration will approach this matter in a different way and we are in good discussion and um, uh, 
good relation with the Iranian side. Um, so our destiny has to do with the area that I think uh, I do agree with some of my colleagues that the security in the Gulf, uh, it needs more than two to play. Uh, we must be all part of the security and therefore the discussion about the security in the Gulf area or Gulf countries must be the discussion among all of us. At the end, we need a collective, collective security, otherwise uh, there will be always uh, problems. I mean, two other countries cannot decide about all these countries. These are the main challenges that we are facing, and we are trying to manage with these challenges, to be honest. Some of them we can solve it. Some of them we can manage with it. Some of them we are thinking that in the future we can solve it. But um, as for the Iranian-American uh, tension, we hope that there will be a new atmosphere, political atmosphere in the near, near future. With the new administrations, uh, if we are talking about the president-elect or the people surrounding him, uh, we know them quite well. Almost all of them, they were very much engaged in the Iraqi affairs. Uh, they were all in the same administration as uh, when President Obama was there. And they were responsible, in fact, for the Iraqi files. So we know them quite good. And we hope that we can have uh, different kinds of discussions with them and at least to manage the crisis and not to increase the tension in this area. Thank you very much. That was my, uh, my point. Yes, uh, Minister. Thank you, Minister. If I may, before we follow our discussion, just a short follow-up. We do not have to forget that before the COVID crisis, as we remember, you're one of the most hit country, uh, there was an internal uprise. There was, it was months, weak months, that especially youths were uh, just rallying in, uh, in uh, Iraq in order to ask um, a better condition, a better condition of living. So what about that? Of course, COVID, 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 everything. But we still have to remember what was going on in Iraq at that time before the pandemic stopped everything. What about the internal discussion and whether the, inter the request yes, that they used I, this I didn't, I didn't. I didn't hear. Um, you said before, before COVID crisis. I think you, are you talking about the demonstrations? Absolutely. I was talking about the, yes, the demonstration, especially the young people demonstrating the street in Iraq. Yes, the demonstrations um, on, in 2019 started uh, in the beginning of October. And, uh, and arrest uh, also started in the southern government of the country. Uh, and uh, there were huge demonstrations also in Baghdad. Uh, of course, this, it means from one side that people are not satisfied with the situation, in fact. Uh, if you are talking about uh, economy and many young people that are unemployed, uh, and they don't see uh, perspectives. So that's, that's the, the main situation, the main cause, I think. Because sometimes when you are suffering and you see um, a better future, then, then hope is there. Many of them, they, they started not to see even hope for the future. Uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, the second reason, to be honest, and once again, I'm saying, the demonstrations is, has to do with internal matters, internal politics, internal economic situation, but also the tension between Washington and, and Tehran affected the society here, affected the society because um, there were two camps and uh, they were against each other and they were selling all the all both sides, they were selling their products inside Iraq. And uh, there were some people buying these products from both sides. So uh, mentioning that, uh, I'm, once again, I'm coming back to my argument that it was originally internally, but external uh, effects were there. Uh, uh, 
Now we don't have such a big demonstrations, although in Nasiriyah still, that's the uh, governor south of the country, still we have uh, people, um, political parties against each other. And there are some kind of demonstrations. Um, this new government, the government of Kadami, when we started, and by the way, I was part of the previous government also. I was deputy prime minister, minister of finance. So I was aware of the situation at that time and what happened exactly in various areas of the country. Um, this government, first we formed a committee to investigate uh, who tried or who was part of this plan of uh, the attacks on demonstration and the investigation is still continuing. And this government also started to have negotiation with many leaders of the, and in fact, many leaders of the prime minister or in the government. So they became part of the political process. And uh, we are trying, of course, to convince those people that there are some problems which we can solve and there are other problems which is difficult to be solved now, especially uh, the economic or financial crisis that we are facing. On long term, of course, we must try to change the whole structure of our economy. And we presented now the white paper, which is a guide to reform our economy. So we are trying to to reform our economy. And we open dialogue with all political parties. And we plan for the early election. We hope that we will have our election June next year. And we, hope, we think these, was, these were part of the demands of the people who were on street and uh, uh, they had their protest movement. Thank you very much. Julian. Thank you. Let me turn now to Rafael Grossi, who is the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, obviously working over a very sensitive issue, um, the question of Iran's nuclear program that has um, consumed so much regional and international attention over recent years and looks like it's going to come back to the forefront of the agenda in the coming months. Um, perhaps in the, in the next round of questions, we can talk about the wider region, but, but for this round, I have two questions, one about what's happening now and what, one about what may come in the future. Firstly, could you give us a sense of um, your perception of the level of Iranian compliance uh, with current agreements? Is the level of Iranian access that they are giving you indicative of a constructive approach that you think can be built on going forward? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, today, and especially uh, the uh, foreign ministers of Oman, Yemen, Kuwait, of course, uh, Iraq, um, uh, all uh, countries that are um, very close to the IEA. They are members um, of the IEA, and we have an excellent uh, degree um, of, of cooperation with all of them. So I'm honored. To, to be there. So many layers um, to, to your question. Um, uh, when it comes to I Iran, the, the issue of the uh, Iranian nuclear program, of course, has been uh, occupying um, the agenda of the IAEA for many years, more than 20, I would say, uh, with ups and downs. Um, it's, been, um, uh, it's been a long story uh, with uh, good moments and complicated moments. I would say when you say um, about levels of compliance, I think we have to um, differentiate um, a, a number of things. Uh, first of all, when it comes to Iran, there is not only the JCPOA that we um, inspect um, in, um, and verify in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, the JCPOA is, if, if you want, if I can describe it in this way, it's like a special mandate we got uh, from the UN Security Council, Resolution 2231, um, in, in uh, 2016, when the JCPOA was implemented. And of course, uh, the IAEA, which is not a party to the JCPOA, but the inspector of the JCPOA, became uh, involved. Um, apart from that, in parallel, we have a comprehensive safeguards agreement 
which covers um, the, the normal operation of the rest of the Iranian uh, program and an additional protocol. An additional protocol is, um, not to become too, too technical, is um, uh, uh, an agreement that gives the agency, not only in Iran, but in many other countries, um, a, a, a heightened degree of, uh, a deeper degree of access. So um, there's, there's much more uh, to it when it comes to Iran than the JCPOA. So when you say compliance, we have to make a differentiation there. Why I say this? Because on the JCPOA, uh, we have a rather uh, paradoxical situation. The JCPOA, as you all know, is still in place. It's still in place in spite of the withdrawal, uh, unilateral withdrawal of one of the initial um, original parties, namely the United States. But the agreement is still in place with a particularity, and this particularity being that after this withdrawal and after some time, Iran uh, announced a series of, a sequence of um, measures to decrease its level of compliance with the JCPOA. So, if you ask me, if you were to ask me nominally whether there is compliance with the JCPOA, no, there is a, 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 a level of, of compliance which is going down. But this is not done, done um, in, in a clandestine way. This is why I talk about a paradox. This is announced and this is verified by us, by the, by the IAEA. And we report about it. And Iran makes no secret about this. And it says that these, um, of course, diminishing degrees of non-compliance or compliance or, or non-compliance with the JCPOA is a result of, a, it's a retaliatory measure to the withdrawal uh, from the United States of America. Does that mean there is no access? Yes, there is access. There is cooperation on the part of Iran. I have my inspectors there right now, as we speak, verifying, as I say, the very specific, you know, the JCPOA is a, is a very detailed, very uh, meticulous uh, sort of an agreement that has many, many <clears throat> elements in it. So we are, uh, we are doing there. In terms of access, this year was, uh, we had a bit of a bumpy uh, ride because for many, many months, um, Iran was not allowing uh, our inspectors to access to important uh, places, which we had requested uh, as part of their um, normal additional protocol and, and comprehensive, comprehensive safeguards agreement. Um, and finally, well, you, you, you may know that I traveled to, to Tehran and, and we were able to overcome that, that temporary setback, if I may put it like that. And so we, are, we, continue, uh, we continue to work. But of course, there are challenges. And, and, and if I could just follow up on that quickly, I, I, what, what sense of confidence do you have that um, Iran could come back into full compliance? And what would be the most critical steps that you would want to see undertaken uh, to, to see that happen? You mean with the JCPOA? Exactly. If, if there was an agreement by the Iran and the, and the US to come back into mutual full compliance, do you think that would be a process that could be easily managed? And what would be the critical steps that you would want to see out of Tehran? Uh, absolutely, it could be done. Um, it was done. And I, let me remind you and remind the participants that uh, back in 2015, the, the agreement was in, in July. 2015, and by what is called the Implementation Day, which came in sometime in January 2016, um, Iran quite quickly, quite fast, I would say, um, complied with a number of quite um, important and far-reaching uh, obligations, like shipping out uh, low enriched uranium uh, by, you know, starting work on the design of um, um, the Iraq uh, reactor by, for example, reducing the number of uh, centrifuges that they would be allowed 
to spin um, as part of their uh, uranium enrichment program. So if there was an agreement and there was political will on all sides, um, we would be able to be there to ascertain as the inspector that this is happening. Of course, uh, the, the political decision is not ours to take, but the, uh, as the, for the feasibility of the action, yes, it would be feasible. Thank you very much. Let me go back to Minister al Busaidi now from Oman, if I may. Um, and, and I wondered if I could pose you a couple of questions. I mean, we've heard a lot about um, various challenges and threats to the security order. Could you perhaps give us your sense of um, what a constructive pathway forward could be right now? I mean, obviously, we hear a lot about uh, whether one talks about the nuclear deal before the regional issues or vice versa, the degree of regional buy-in or not. Um, and you also obviously have, and this is something that we haven't touched so much, huge economic medical challenges across the region. If we're talking about a viable security architecture going forward, what would be the Omani vision for that? So that would be my first question. My second question would be, um, where can non-regional outsiders help you? So if one is thinking about European actors in particular, um, what would you see as a role that those states, whether um, individually or as the EU could together, um, could do to, to support you on those combined tracks? Please, Minister. Thank you. I think if I may, or at least express the hope that we can all agree that there needs to be a dialogue, uh, a meaningful dialogue between all the regional players. And to maybe try and reset uh, the button for regional, new regional relationships. All of us want the best for the region. And even those who might disagree with us on certain issues want the best for the region. But if we start the blame game, then I'm afraid confidence tends to break. It gets broken and relations deteriorate. We need to move beyond that phase and we must be disciplined about this and not really indulge into the temptation to criticize each other all the time. Meaningful, transparent dialogue among us all is a prerequisite among us here, people of the region, governments of the region, before we seek any help by our friends. As they say in English, charity begins at home. So we must be faithful in the respect and support we offer to all of our partners. And that is the pathway, I think, to a better environment in terms of security and stability. And here, you can help us. You can speak out uh, freely with every single one of us because you are genuine partners of the region and friends and allies in Europe and in the United States. And I think it will do no harm uh, to, uh, to that relationship. In fact, it will be strengthened if you speak straight to us uh, and not just tell us what we like to hear. I think that, you know, there's a big difference. Uh, with that comes what my brother from Kuwait has mentioned is the cent central in how you can help us and that is in the economic sphere. Partnerships, diversification, every country in the Gulf now is embarking on diversification. Every country in the Gulf has put plans and visions how to achieve that. So in addition to work among us and cooperate in realizing some of these plans, I think our friends in Europe can also join in and partner with us in in, in, in the path forward uh, that will bring deeper interest, deeper bonds uh, between us here in the region and between us and you in Europe and elsewhere. 
Thank and you. and do you and do you think there's any particular possibility of progress in Yemen? I know that that's an area that, that you're very focused, obviously. Um, what's your sense on possibilities there to take things forward positively? Well, uh, as uh, my friend and brother from Yemen has has mentioned, uh, I think uh, an international base rule system has to be respected. Law has to be respected. Agreements have to be respected. He mentioned the Riyadh agreement, which we fully support, but also there is the Stockholm agreement. And now Martin Griffiths is hoping to achieve a joint declaration, a political declaration, a statement between the parties that I hope they would all sign up to and take them to the negotiating table. Because I think everyone agrees, inside and outside Yemen, there is no military solution to this problem. We've got to work harder uh, and pull together to bring them to the table and negotiate their future. It is a Yemeni problem after all. It's uh, and it needs a Yemeni solution. We can help in that process, daily. The humanitarian situation is dear and it's very difficult. And I think uh, that has to be also addressed uh, in the most effective way. And uh, I wish we have much more resources to be able to help. We're doing what we can, but I also want to remind the international community that there is an obligation in that, in that sphere uh, to bring uh, uh, a plan of action for the reconstruction of Yemen post a political agreement, uh, when, when we have a political agreement uh, on the party and a roadmap for the future of Yemen. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, um, Minister Al Busaidi, because it gives me the next question also to your colleague, uh, Yemeni colleague. Um, Minister Al Busaidi said uh, we can help to have together all the different Yemeni factions and to help them to come to an end, to put this war to an end. But we know that the Yemeni conflicts, and you remember this also in your first intervention, how much this conflict is emblematic of uh, interne in internal, but also international rivalries. Um, you said before, please do not consider the Yemeni conflict just a humanitarian crisis. This is very important. So what if we have to consider how much the international community can help you in order to get out of this long war, what do you expect uh, by the uh, next US administration? And coming to the internal uh, situation, uh, which, how much you as government coexist with the southern transitional government that we know control the Aden areas? Please. Well, 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 thank you very much. I mean, I, I share many of, of my, my, my uh, distinguished colleagues from Oman uh, said, we, we need to solve this. It's a Yemeni, Yemeni problem that needs a Yemeni solution. And, and I agree with him fully. There is no old military solution to this problem. But the problem is, and we've seen it before Sweden, we've seen it before Kuwait, and I, I'm, I'm happy to see my, my also friend from Kuwait here. Yes, there is no old military solution to the problem. But I'm afraid with the Houthis, if there's no military pressure, we will not get to that point where we can actually uh, focus on a political uh, aspects. It was because we were a few kilometers from the port in Hodeida that the Houthis finally agreed to go back in 2018 uh, in December to Sweden. And I, and I think, uh, and you, you rightly mentioned my wary of, of the first point I mentioned in my first intervention, which is viewing Yemen as solely a humanitarian issue. I mentioned this not because the humanitarian situation is not, uh, it's not dire, it is. I mean, I, I've seen the reports, I, I live in there, and, and I know that we need to do everything we can to alleviate the suffering of the people. But I'm, I'm worried about that when the international community, especially the donors, would just view Yemen from this angle, the Houthis unfortunately would have this illusion of being recognized in the future. And that sole, uh, the same angle of just viewing Yemen as a humanitarian and, and, and the rapprochement between some of the actors with the Houthis would feed this illusion. And in a sense, it would hurt Martin Griffith's UN-led process because the Houthis, 
as they did in Kuwait back in 2016 when we have 100 plus days. They were so close to, to ending this deal. And then eventually, because of some rapprochement between international uh, actors, they really thought that they could get more outside of Kuwait than they would get when signing with Wilde Sheikh, the previous uh, envoy in Kuwait. And that's the problem. So we deal with the humanitarian situation. We'll do everything we can. Access is not mainly a problem. Inflation is supporting the central bank. And all these, we would work with them. Uh, deal with how to not the Houthis divert all the, and profiteer from from uh, from uh, from, uh, from the humanitarian like like the Europeans do in, in their meeting. But at the same time, we need to focus on on, on and how and how to move forward. You you mentioned the Southern Transitional Council and and the U.S. position or potential position. Uh, there's two uh, different issues. I think uh, the latter one with uh, with the Southern Transitional Council. I mentioned it in my third point in my previous uh, in my previous intervention. These are three issues that needs to be together dealt if we are to get out of this quagmire. The humanitarian aspects, Iran has to see support and in respect international uh, law. And also we have to deal with the internal problems with the coalition. And one of them is the SDC, the Southern Transitional Council believes that it's the sole representative of the South. That is not true. I wish it would have been true. It would have made the problem of the South easier. We have now a Southern, Southern problem because of this. How to deal with it? The United Arab Emirates is the key. They have to recalibrate their agenda. They have to realign their objectives in Yemen so as to be uh, in line with the main objectives of the coalition. There is no way around it. The SDC would actually go and implement the Riyadh agreements with the help of the United Arab Emirates, and I hope that will lead to that. Linking it to the U.S. Uh, 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 potential uh, influence in Yemen, I, I think it, it deals more with the Iranian issue. I, 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 and again, sending bad signals to the Houthis would mean a lot. And being lenient on Iran and having Iran... Uh, uh, been access to a lot of billions and tens of billions, even though it's their money, but they're not uh, free to use this money to wreak havoc in my country. And I think that has to be part of the deal because we're in it together. And then like my, my colleague says, we have to be sitting on the table, not exclusively, but our issues have to be sitting on the table if we see it. So if there is a new deal with Iran, let it be. We want Iran to be a, a big, a uh, good neighbor in the neighborhood, but they have to start acting like a good neighbor before we can accept them. And to deal with the Iranian deal without actually dealing with Yemen and Hezbollah and others, it would be just like putting gasoline on fire. And, and I don't think that will help the international community. That will not help us. And eventually, Yemen will become a bigger problem than it is right now, and it would cost the international community more to solve. I hope I answered your question, and then I, I could elaborate thank some more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Julian. Thank you very much. Let me turn back uh, to Mr. Al Hajraf, Secretary General of the GCC. Um, we've talked a lot about Iran, so 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 why don't we change tack slightly? And I'd, I'd like to ask you two questions. One is a state of intra-Arab Gulf relations. Um, obviously, there is a sharp fault line and divide there. The blockade of Qatar has been in place for quite some time. What is your sense of, 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 of breaking through that, 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 that um, division? Obviously, Jared Kushner and others from the US, the current US administration will be in the region this week. Um, do you think, and there's talk of, of potential kind of Saudi Qatari uh, progress, are we any closer to, to a breakthrough there? Secondly, um, a number of GCC states have, of course, recently reached normalization agreements with Israel. Um, and that's quite a, a remarkable shift for the region, and it does herald, in a sense, uh, the, the, the formalization of, of a new order, which is as much about Iran as it is about Turkey. Um, could you give me your sense of um, what you think that means for, for the region and, and, and whether you expect to see further GCC states moving in that direction? Please. Thank you, Julian, for, for the two questions. Um, and if you allow me, I probably would like to go back to the brief questions you asked Thomas Al Hadrami about uh, the Yemen situation. Um, everyone knows that Yemen is, is uh, the next door neighbor to the GCC and the southern part of Saudi Arabia. And the stability in Yemen is very crucial to the GCC. And the GCC initiative is actually one of the three main 
pillars uh, uh, for solution in Yemen. So what can you help as European Union, I think, to put more pressure on the Houthis to accept the peace negotiation? Um, I think you can put pressure on Yemen, in, uh, Iran to stop uh, intervening in the Yemeni situation. I think you can help by supporting the UN uh, envoy uh, Martin Griffith uh, to conclude uh, his, his work. Uh, my biggest worry um, is the Yemen after the peace agreement if we reach there, because rebuilding Yemen uh, requires a lot of resources. And in light of COVID-19, I am afraid that the resources won't be available or it will be available, but not to the scale or to the amount is needed. So I think we need to think way ahead of how to plan uh, properly for that time because the Yemeni people deserve to live, to live in peace and rebuilding the Yemen requires the international community to step uh, into this, this process, which will take so many years to, to, to see the result. Um, back to your questions about the rift within the GCC. Um, as, as I said in my previous interventions, it's the GCC went over the last 40 years with ups and downs, and it is very acceptable to have the differences in some of, uh, or, or differences in the views of how to, to address some, some of the issues. Um, we, we've seen the genuine effort, noble effort by the late Emir of Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah, um, which stepped in from day one to resolve this rift. Um, his effort was um, widely supported by the GCC countries as well as the international community. And uh, the effort, although he passed away last uh, September, but I think his legacy will remain. And I think uh, our friends and colleagues, Minister of Kuwait, Foreign Affairs of Kuwait, can probably elaborate on this. But from my positions, I can see the effort is ongoing and with the support from all the member states and with the friends, we hope that we will reach a conclusion uh, and to turn this chapter and to start a new chapter as we are approaching the fifth decade of the GCC. Um, your second question uh, regarding the normalizations that took place between some member states and Israel. Um, I, I would say that this is a sovereign decision. Uh, they have the right to, to take this kind of actions. Uh, we fully respect that, uh, but I would like also to remind everyone that the Arab Peace Initiative is still on the table since 2002. We strongly believed with the two-state solution uh, to end the long-standing uh, Arab-Israel conflict or Palestine-Israel conflict because there will be no peace and prosperity in the regions if we don't solve these issues. Uh, I think the two-state solution is, is fair for everyone. And this is just an implementation of the UN resolutions, which is very um, uh, important uh, as we uh, addressing the security within the region. And I think um, if we guarantee that the international law is respected, the UN resolution is implemented, and we create a mechanism where we keep engaging in a constructive dialogue to address all these issues, I think we will be in better positions. Um, we strongly believe that the people in the region, and the, the, the Middle East region, know their region better than anyone else, yet there is a huge interest of the international community within the region knowing that 20% of the world energy is imported from the region, knowing the strategic locations of the region. And I think this kind of partnership, uh, which we would like to see, 
enhancing the dialogue, enhancing exchanging views, addressing the issues in a very open, transparent way. And I think this is what's needed uh, post COVID-19 pandemic because we have seeing countries are grouping in economic reform. This will be our biggest challenge for the future. I think for the next 10 years or so, the economic consequences of the pandemic will be very huge. And I think with the reform um, effort going on within the GCC, and I, we, we believe this will require a lot of collaborations with uh, friends in the EU and others uh, across the globe because there is a huge interest, mutual interest that combining everyone. Thank you, Secretary General. So I go quickly back to uh, Minister Al Sabah from Kuwait. Um, uh, the Secretary General remind uh, the normalization of relationship with Israel, but we know which is the position of Kuwait. This is something that Kuwait will not do, uh, differently from what we have seen with Bahrain, a United Arab Emirates. So, is this is the solution? And the second, uh, as Oman, like Oman, you had a, mm, you had experienced an historical change in leadership. Do the new leadership? Uh, which are the priorities of the new leadership? Please, Minister. Well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, regarding uh, normalization ties, uh, each and every country has its own sovereign decision to take based on what it uh, sees its, its national security and what can benefit from it. So. Uh, this is a, a sovereign decision by any country. Uh, regarding the peace process, and as I've mentioned, Iraq, and as I've mentioned with other uh, uh, very uh, sizzling and boiling points in the region, it's by maintaining international law. It's by, it's by implementing international law. International law, it is what s saved us for, for now, over 70 years after World War II from succumbing into chaos and into law of uh, jungle. Uh, Kuwait was subjected to invasion. And back now, almost uh, 30 years, uh, through international law, uh, we, we have uh, been able to regain our uh, sovereignty uh, territorial integrity and our legitimacy uh, in this matter. And you can go with everything else. With the peace process, we think it is also by maintaining international law. There are numerous international references in it where a uh, two-state solution is very much visible. And uh, peace as a strategic uh, means for the Arab world, uh, which, which was clearly indicated back in 2002 with the Arabic uh, peace plan. We think it is, uh, it is the one for the way forward in, uh, in this regard. So this, this is our position. If all of the concerns is addressed, then, then uh, Kuwait will join as, uh, as, as all countries that has agreed on with the Arabic uh, Peace Initiative. Um, regarding, and th thank you for your words, and also thank you for all of the expressions that I hear so, from so, some of my colleagues about uh, the late uh, His Highness Sheikh Sabah's uh, mediation effort. Uh, this year uh, actually marked uh, uh, the passing away of two leaders, uh, two leaders who symbolizes wisdom uh, in the region, uh, Sultan Qaboos and the late His Highness uh, Sheikh Sabah. Uh, both of those leaders are founding fathers of uh, GCC, where uh, at that time, back in 1981, it was just in the dawn of the Iraqi-Iranian uh, war. So the whole region was in a, in a very a tipping, boiling uh, point, and therefore, uh, Sultan Qaboos, with Sheikh Subah and with other uh, leaders in GCC, um, um, 
managed to create this idea, which translated after to an institution of uh, principles and values and beliefs, which is uh, GCC. Kuwait will continue its, in, uh, its uh, mediation effort. Con Kuwait will continue in uh, prevailing uh, dialogue over uh, conflict and over uh, violence. Kuwait will continue as an advocate for international law. Kuwait will continue also for advocating, uh, strengthening the pillar of states in each and every country and not undermining in any shape or form uh, this, this, the, the pillars of state in any uh, countries in, in, in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm hoping we can go to Minister Hussein in Baghdad. I see his camera has just lost us for a second. No, he, he's there, Mr. Hussein. Thank you very much. Um, I wondered if, if, if we could just explore a bit more how, um, how outside uh, players, and I, I guess particularly the, the EU and European states, can support uh, some of the reform needs in Iraq. Um, I think as Europeans look at Iraq today, they see a, a devastated economy. Um, they see um, uh, quite widespread corruption. Uh, there's clearly a, a, a need for a significant security sector reform, and, and you have the presence of, of militias. As um, I think you discussed earlier, the kind of the need to, to reassert a kind of sovereign of Iraq unfolds. How can European states help you address and move forward in the reform agenda to address some of those specific needs? Uh. Once again, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this uh, question. Um, as many people know that the infra infrastructure in Iraq has been destroyed, and for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons has to do with the fact that Iraq is, was in war, engaged in war, internal war, external wars, uh, for the last 50, perhaps 50 years. So uh, that, that means almost everything related to infrastructure has been destroyed. And to rebuild the infrastructure and also to rebuild our economy, we need um, first investment and capital, foreign capitals, but we need also know-how, the know-how. To get these both, uh, Europe can play an important role. And uh, we are in good discussions uh, with the European Union, and we have got an agreement, uh, cooperation agreement with the European Union. And also uh, with the European countries, uh, we have got good uh, relationship. And uh, Europe can play also a role in uh, helping us to guarantee our security. Still, we have got many security problems. So Europe uh, has got the history here and knows this. Many of European countries, they know the society quite well. And uh, of course, uh, uh, some of them, uh, they have got good relationship with all neighboring countries. So that will help us. Uh, that's why we are focusing on Europe and uh, we try to uh, get their help and their support to, to Iraq. I, uh, I think if, if so I may... Answering your questions, Europe can play an important role. And if I may just quickly follow up on that, um, I mean, I think one of the concerns that Europeans have is that um, the, the, the political leadership in Baghdad uh, may not have the, the, either the internal strength or, 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 or perhaps at times a will um, to press forward with these necessary reforms. And obviously, um, there is a concern that there are multiple power centers in Iraq and that it's very hard. Um, and obviously, you as a government do face many internal challenges to take this forward. So how is the Iraqi government going to establish that, that, that kind of of internal coherence and, and, and authority uh, to drive forward this agenda to actually get the European support? Because I think if not, Europeans will remain wary. Um, you are right. Some of these reforms has to do or some of the problems uh, in uh, our political system has to do with the bureaucracy. Um, the other problem, which is a big problem, has to do with corruption in the political system. 
so fighting these two, it needs um, vision and we have got the vision. It needs leadership. We have got the leadership, but uh, it needs also uh, internal support. Um, this government and um, most of the uh, my my colleagues, I mean the ministers, um, uh, they are they don't have political parties or they don't have any political bloc in in the parliament, including the new prime minister, and this creates huge prob problem to implement the plans that we developed. Uh, uh, but fighting corruption was also part of the previous government. Uh, uh, I think we need a different system. Uh, the other problem that we are facing, the, uh, the Iraqi constitution is, um, I mean, if we talk about the economic uh, system, uh, the constitution mm, is demanding to have a kind of liberal, open society, but also uh, a market economy system. While the whole bureaucracy and the whole political administrations in, in this country is depending still on government and public sector. And of course, this has to do with the uh, uh, with the previous government, uh, the Iraqi government, uh, since 1968, uh, they were following a kind of commando economy or socialist economy. So to to transfer the whole system into a liberal, uh, democratic, uh, uh, more open society and more open economy, it needs a lot of time. It needs strengthening the uh, private sector, it needs more invest investment, it needs a different kind of laws, it needs to fight bureaucracy, but also to, uh, to fight corruption. So it is a, a long way, to be honest, but uh, many other countries, they can help us. And among these countries, of course, uh, um, uh, the European countries can do a lot for us. Thank you very much, Minister. We really have five minutes left before the end of this panel. And two quick questions for the Director General of the International Atomic uh, Energy uh, Agency, uh, Mr. Grossi. Uh, considering the situation in the Gulf region, uh, which is, in your opinion, what should be done in order to uh, implement, to promote the much needed peace and security in uh, the Gulf region? And second, what your, which are your expectations uh, from the uh, future um, uh, U.S. administration? Please. Well, thank you very much. In, in terms of um, our own mandate, um, which is um, uh, important, but of course focused on uh, non-proliferation um, and also on uh, technical cooperation in many areas uh, in the peaceful applications um, of our nuclear science, technology, and nuclear energy, which is very important. But I would say that if you put the question in terms, in, in, in political terms, I think it is um, crucially important to see a region fully uh, committed to uh, the non-proliferation norm. I think um, in the very illuminating um, uh, presentations that we had today, um, several references were made to the past, to a past where on occasion, um, the non-proliferation norms were avoided or there were attempts to uh, violate them with uh, dire consequences for the entire region. So the, the, the role and the, the uh, important um, cooperative relationship with the IEEA, the uh, important uh, commitment of all the countries in the region to the non-proliferation regime is of course, essential. And more importantly, when we see a, ch a changing landscape in terms not only of nuclear non-proliferation, but nuclear energy itself. We are living in a world where uh, in the Gulf, which would have been unimaginable a few years ago, uh, you have the United Arab Emirates having started its first nuclear power plant with three more units to go. You have uh, Saudi Arabia having uh, indicated to us a strong interest in moving into the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. You have um, Egypt now moving very, very seriously into a nuclear 
power program. So the entire, I would say, equation in terms of, of, of the region um, and in terms of nuclear uh, energy and all nuclear matters together in the, in the, in the compact of issues that uh, are there uh, is changing rapidly. And so uh, we are ready, of course, uh, at the IAEA. We are working with the Arab League. We are working, of course, with the, with the GCC. We are working with all the institutions and the nations uh, independently. Uh, on your last um, question, I would say um, the commitment and the, the cooperation from the United States uh, is, is traditional. And uh, of course, there would be nuances if a new administration came to power, uh, but the, the uh, cooperation and the support of the United States is something I uh, take as, as something which uh, is not under any question or doubt. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all our distinguished guests for participating to this panel. Thank you to Julian for co-moderating with me. I wish all the guests to host next year inshallah if the situation would allow us to be all together here in rome instead to of talking and uh, through remote of course is is not easy but it was very very interesting so and thanks to all of you who uh, decided to participate to this panel thank you very much shukran